Hello, everyone. Hello, hello, hello. Welcome to another dramatic reading of Dracula. <sighs> How are we all doing? Hi, Subber. <laughs> I don't know what I could have possibly done to deserve that. Goodness gracious. <laughs> <laughs> Hello, everyone. I'm taking a quick gander through to double check exactly where we ended. Yeah. I don't know if I'll be able to sum up what we've read so far in Dracula very easily, but I will do my best. There's like, there's a certain... Oh, Summer, Summer gave a bunch of subs? Thanks, bud. That's very sweet. Thank you. If you were gifted a sub by Summer, make sure you take the time to say thank you. turning down the this isn't a spooky story is it i mean it is dracula <laughs> so yeah i would say there's spooky elements and um, we have a warning list i don't know if it's fully fleshed out um but spooky on this channel never um so Dracula, yeah, I missed half the book. Yeah, yeah, this is chapter 13. We read all of the other chapters. They are on VODs um, on my YouTube channel. Um, but basically, Oh my gosh, how do I do this? So Dracula is about a guy named Jonathan. I know, it's crazy. <laughs> You'd think I would say it's about a guy named Dracula. It is, but um, you'd be shocked how little Dracula is actually in it for a decent amount of the book. Um, so Dracula is about a guy named Jonathan who goes to what was then called um, Transylvania uh, to meet with a count who would like to buy property in England the illustrious uh, Count Dracula. When he gets to Transylvania, basically every person he meets is like doing the cross, doing all sorts of symbols on themselves, like, uh, you know, warding off evil, etc. Anytime he's like, yeah, I'm about to go hang out with Dracula and sell him a house. And they're like, oh, gee, oh, no, oh, no, oh, no, please don't do that. Please don't go there. And he's like, wow, everybody here is like, they're really nice, but like, they're so weird. Anyway, I'm going to go see Dracula. So he goes to see Dracula and a bunch of fucking shenanigans happen. He becomes Dracula's, uh, uh, basically his hostage. Um, he realizes pretty quickly something, something hinky's going on with this house. The second that he's in the carriage to like go to Dracula's house, shit goes down. Um, but we, we don't have time to unpack all that. Uh, uh, but yeah, the whole time that he's at Dracula's house, he's like, this dude's weird. There's weird shit going on. He goes into the attic. He finds a bunch of ladies there. They try to bite him. He's like, what the fuck? Um, and he's basically left for dead inside of the house when Dracula goes uh, to England to be in his new house that he bought, you know? But guess what? Jonathan lived. Take that, motherfucker. But we don't have time. We don't. We have to move on. What happened to Jonathan? We'll find out later. So 
we go to England um, and we meet Lucy and Mina. Um, <laughs> Mina is uh, Jonathan's betrothed. And so she's writing Jonathan like, I'm so excited to see you. I haven't heard from you yet. That's super weird, but it's fine. I'm sure you're fine. I'm having a good time hanging out. It's it's good. We're fine, you know? Um, and Mina uh, is besties with a lady named Lucy. And Lucy's just a doll. All, all her milkshake brings all the boys. She has so many suitors. She's a sweetie pie. Um, she and Mina are besties. They go to stay at a house by the sea for a while. Um, and the whole time Mina's like, man, I miss Jonathan. I hope he's doing good. Winks at the camera. And, um, and Mina's like, yeah, I have so many boys. I hope they're all doing good too. But really... Um, the, the real worrying thing about all of this is, um, number one, Lucy's mom is super sick. And number two, Lucy is doing all kinds of weird sleepwalking. She keeps on sleepwalking and it's stressing the fuck out of everybody else. Lucy's mom, Mina, everybody's like just trying to keep her from sleepwalking into weird situations. And guess what? Fuck me. But, um... <clears throat> A whole, a whole ass thing happens where a boat crashes right next to where they're staying. There's only one surviving person on the boat. They find a bunch of stuff on the boat that's like, man, everybody's dying on this boat. That's so weird. Why is everybody dying on the boat? Well, who knows? It's just me. I'm, it's just the captain now. I'll go down with the ship. And he does. Uh, and a weird black dog runs off into the forest. And everybody's like, that's weird. Um, and so uh, a flash, flash back over to Lucy, who goes on one of her really fun, cool sleepwalking adventures. And Mina goes outside to try and find her. Because, yes, she just straight up walked out of the house. <laughs> Mina goes to try and find her. And, and could have swore. Could have swore she saw a man bending over Lucy at a bench but by the time she gets there there's no man there at all um so she's like oh my gosh I have to get Lucy inside she looks so indecent it's hilarious the things these people worry about she's like oh my god she's barefoot I gotta get her inside now before somebody sees her tootsies um <laughs> so gets her inside right cool um they find Jonathan holy shit John, there's a lady writes to Mina and is like, homie, I have Jonathan here. Um, he's really fucked up. He's saying shit that makes no sense, but he's here. Would you like to come see him? And everybody's like, go, go see him. And she's like, all right. Um, I'm sure Lucy's fine and pieces out and, uh, and goes to find Jonathan um, because he's still not in the country. <laughs> Uh, meanwhile, um, Lucy is not doing super great. Um, she keeps getting sick. All of her suitors, all of her many suitors that keep coming over to the house are noticing that she is, like, not doing super well. Um, uh, keep in mind, she has, she has chosen someone at this point. She is engaged. <laughs> but all these boys, they keep coming to the yard, you know? And they're noticing that something's weird. Um... She is exhibiting very strange signs. She'll like rapidly decline in health um, and then be okay for a few days and then rapidly decline in health again. Um, so one of the boys who wants to smooch her is named Dr. Seward. And uh, he has, I believe, I think it's Dr. Seward who calls Van Helsing. I'm pretty sure. Um, but basically one of them is like, I know a guy. I'm gonna call a guy. I think he. I think he might have some answers here. Um, Van Helsing shows up, and um, we, the reader, know, but nobody else knows. But we, the reader, know that he's he's like looking at her, looking at these like marks on her neck. Um, they're transfusing blood into her, and she's fine. But then suddenly the blood's all gone, and she's bad again. And he's like, "Yo, bro, I gotta go." 
I'm leaving. I'll be back in a few days with a shit ton of garlic. And that's exactly what happens. <laughs> he comes back with a shit ton of garlic. Um, he, he basically, he suspects what is going on. Um, he, he thinks, he thinks some, some gothic horror nonsense is happening in this house. He hangs up garlic everywhere. Um, he does all of these things. He puts a cross on her, right? And she's doing great. Um, but eventually everything just kind of like falls apart. I can't, I honestly can't remember all of the details, but things are doing good. They're doing bad. They're doing good. They're doing bad. Right. And, um, her mom dies and eventually she dies, um, which is where we left off. We left off on, on the night, the, the horrible night that, um, that she died and everyone found her. Yeah, they, they transfused blood into her so many times to try and keep her alive. All of the boys, all of the boys that loved her gave blood to this poor woman who is such a sweetie pie. Rip in peace. Um, so yeah, uh, where we left off was basically all of them trying to figure out what, what to do. Um... Yeah, this was how this is how the last chapter ended off. I stood behind Van Helsing and said, "Well, poor girl, there is peace for her at last. It's the end." He turned to me and said with grave solemnity, "Not so, alas, it is only the beginning." And when I asked him what he meant, he shook his head and answered, "We can do nothing as yet. Just wait and see." This man, this man is like this girl's going to raise from the dead and won't just fucking say it out loud. <laughs> Like, this girl got bit by a vamp. I think she's going to be a vamp. But he won't say it. He won't say it out loud. He just keeps saying weird shit. <laughs> uh, anyways. Um, that's... Uh... Would you? Would I say, I think this person's going to raise from the dead? I mean, if a lot of vampire bullshit was happening around there, maybe. If Sam died under suspicious vampiric circumstances, I might be like, bro, we should keep an eyeball on that casket. So yeah, that was me. I skipped so much shit, but that's basically everything that's happened up till this point. Um, Mina and Jonathan got married. Uh, she went to find him and they got married. Um, she was like, I'm not, I can tell something horrible happened. You do not have to tell me what it was. I trust you. I love you. If it would, you know, if it would be good for you to tell me, then I'm here for you. But if you don't want to tell me, I'm still here for you. Um, and he's basically, like, sort of healing from the trauma of everything that happened when he was with Dracula. So that's what's going on with them. Um, and all of the boys that loved Mina are super depressed back in England. <laughs> so, are we ready? I'm trying to remember all the... Uh, oh my god, I have to remember what numbers correspond to what... Uh, da, 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 yeah. We start with Dr. Seward, dude. Ready? Chapter 13, Dr. Seward's Diary. The funeral, the funeral. <laughs> Ahem. Holy shit. <laughs> oh. 
All right. Okay. Shh. Everything's fine. <laughs> Fuck. Okay. The funeral was arranged for the next succeeding day so that Lucy and her mother might be buried together. I attended to all the ghastly formalities, and the urbane undertaker proved that his staff were afflicted or blessed with something of his own obsequious suavity. Even the woman who performed the last offices for the dead remarked to me in a confidential, brother professional way when she had come out from the death chamber. She makes a very be- Oh, wait. <clears throat> she makes a very beautiful corpse, sir. It's quite a privilege to attend on her. It's not too much to say that she will do credit to our establishment. I noticed that Van Helsing never kept far away. This was possible from the disordered state of things in the household. There were no relatives at hand, and as Arthur had to be back the next day to attend at his father's funeral, we were unable to notify anyone who should have been bidden. Under the circumstances, Van Helsing and I took it upon ourselves to examine papers, etc. He insisted upon looking over Lucy's papers himself. I asked him why, for I feared that he, being a foreigner, might not be aware of English legal requirements, and so might, in ignorance, make some unnecessary trouble. But he answered me, Nope, wrong, wrong character. Nope, nope, nope. There we go. <laughs> there might be a little bit of juggling here while I remember where everybody else is. I know, I know. You forget that I am a lawyer as well as a doctor. But this is not altogether for the law. You knew that when you avoided the coroner. I have more than him to avoid. There may be papers more, such as this. As he spoke, he took from his pocketbook the memorandum which he had been, which had been in Lucy's breast and which she had torn in her sleep. When you find anything of the solicitor, who is for the late Mrs. Westenra, seal all her papers and write him tonight. For me, I watch here in the room, and in Miss Lucy's old room all night, and I might search for what it may be. It is not well that her very thoughts go into the hands of strangers. I went on with my part of the work, and in another half hour had found the name and address of Mrs. Westenra's solicitor and had written to him. All the poor lady's papers were in order. Explicit directions regarding the place of burial were given. I had hardly sealed the letter when, to my surprise, Van Helsing walked into the room, saying, Can I help you, friend John? I am free, and if I may, my service is to you. Have you got what you looked for? I asked, to which he replied, I did not look for any specific thing. I only hope to find and find I have all that there was, only some letters and a few memoranda and a diary new begun. But I have them here, and we shall for the present day say nothing of them. I shall see that poor lad tomorrow evening, and with his sanction, I shall use some. When we had finished the work in hand, he said to me, And now, friend John! <laughs> and now, friend John, I think we may be to bed. We want to sleep, both you and I, and rest to recuperate. Tomorrow we shall have much to do. But for the tonight, there is no need for us, alas! Before turning in, we went to look at poor Lucy. The undertaker had certainly done his work well, for the room was turned into a small chapelle ardente. There was a wilderness of beautiful white flowers, and death was made as little repulsive as might be. The end of the winding sheet was laid over the face, with the professor bent over and turned it gently back. We both stared at the beauty before us, the tall wax candles showing a sufficient light to note it well. All of Lucy's loveliness had come back to her in death. The hours that had passed, instead of leaving traces of decay's effacing fingers, had but restored the beauty of life, till positively I could not believe my eyes and I was looking at a corpse. The professor looked sternly grave. He had not loved her as I had. There was no need for tears in his eyes. He said to me, Remain till I return, and left the room. He came back with a handful of wild garlic from the box waiting in the hall, but which had not been opened, and placed the flowers among the others on and around the bed. He took from his neck inside his collar a gold crucifix and placed it over the mouth. He restored the sheet to its place, and we came away. I was undressing in my own room when, with a premonitory tap at the door, he entered, and at once began to speak. 
Tomorrow, I want you to bring me, before night, a set of post-mortem knives. Uh, was, must we make an autopsy, I asked? Yes and no. I want to operate, but not as you think. Let me tell you now, but not a word to another. I want to cut off her head and take out her heart. <laughs> This dude. <laughs> like, it's a good idea. <laughs> it's a great idea, even. But um, maybe, maybe pitch this differently. <laughs> he has trouble pitching things in like a normal way. Um, ah, you a surgeon, and so shocked. You, whom I have seen with no tremble of hand or heart, do operations of life and death that make the rest shudder. Oh, but I must not forget, my dear friend John. You loved her, and I have not forgotten it, for it is I that shall operate, and you must only help. I would like to do it tonight, but for Arthur, I must not. He will be free after his father's funeral tomorrow, and he will want to see her, to see it. Then, when she is coffined and ready for the next day, you and I shall come when all are sleeping. We shall unscrew the coffin lid and do our operation, and replace all so that none know save we alone. But why do it at all? The girl is dead. Why mutilate her poor body without need? And if there is no necessity for a post-mortem and nothing to gain by it, no good to her, to us, to science, to human knowledge, then why do it? Without such, it is monstrous." For answer, he put his hand on my shoulder and said with infinite tenderness, Friend John, I pity your poor bleeding heart, and I love you the more because it does so bleed, and if I could, I would take on myself the burden that you bear. But there are things that you know not, things that you shall know, and bless me for knowing, though they are not pleasant things. John, my child, you have been my friend now many years. And yet, did you ever know me to do anything without good cause? I may err, I am but man, but I believe in all I do. Was it not for these causes that you send for me when the great trouble came? Yes! Were you not amazed, nay horrified, when I would not let Arthur kiss his love, though she was dying, and snatched him away with all my strength? Yes! And yet, you saw how she thanked me, with her so beautiful dying eyes, her voice too so weak, and she kiss my rough old hand and bless me, yes. And did you not hear me swear promise to her that so she closed her eyes grateful? Yes, I have good reason now for all I want to do. You have for many years trusted me. You have believed me weeks past when there be things so strange that you might have well doubt. Believe me yet a little, friend John. If you trust me not, then I must tell what I think. And that is not perhaps well. And if I work, as work I shall, no matter trust or not trust, without my friend trust in me, I work with heavy heart, and feel oh so lonely when I want all help and courage that may be. He paused a moment and went on solemnly. Friend John, there are strange, terrible days before us. Let us not be two, but one, that so we work to a good end. Will you not have faith in me? I took his hand and promised him. I held my door open as he went away and watched him go into his room and close the door. As I stood without moving, I saw one of the maids pass silently along the passage. She had her back toward me, so did not see me, and went into the room where Lucy lay. The sight touched me. Devotion is so rare, and we are so grateful to those who show it unasked to those we love. Here was a poor girl putting aside the terrors which she naturally had of death, to watch alone by the bier of the mistress whom she loved, so that the poor clay might not be lonely till laid to eternal rest. I must have slept long and soundly, for it was broad daylight when Van Helsing waked me by coming into my room. He came over to my bedside and said, You need not trouble about the knives. We shall not do it. Why not? I asked, for his solemnity from the night before had greatly impressed me. Because, he said sternly, it is too late or too early. See? Here he held up the golden crucifix. This was stolen in the night. How stolen, I asked in wonder, since you have it now. 
I get it back from the worthless wretch who stole it, from the woman who robbed the dead and the living. Her punishment will surely come, but not through me. She knew not altogether what she did, and thus, unbeknowing, she only stole. And now we must wait. He went away without a word, leaving me with a new mystery to think of, a new puzzle to grapple with. The forenoon was a dreary time, but at noon the solicitor came. Mr. Marcond of Holman Sons Marcond Litterdale. He was very genial and very appreciative of what we had done, and took off our hands all cares as to details. During lunch he told us that Mrs. Westenra had for some time expected sudden death from her heart, and had put her affairs in absolute order. He informed us that with the exception of a certain entailed property of Lucy's father, which now in default of direct issue went back to a distant branch of the family, the whole estate, real and personal, was left absolutely to Arthur Holmwood. When he had told us so much, he went on. Oh, oops, wrong one. Little... <laughs> Well, frankly, we did our best to prevent such a testamentary disposition, and pointed out certain contingencies that might leave her daughter either penniless or not so free as she should be to act regarding a matrimonial alliance. Indeed, we pressed the matter so far that we almost came into collision, for she asked us if we were or were not prepared to carry out her wishes. Of course, we had then no alternative but to accept— we were right in principle, ninety-nine times out of a hundred we should have proved by the logic of events the accuracy of our judgment. Frankly, however, I must admit that in this case any other form of disposition would have rendered impossible the carrying out of her wishes, for by her predeceasing her daughter the latter would have come into possession of the property, and even had she only survived her mother by five minutes her property would, in case there were no will, and a will was a practical impossibility in such a case, have been treated at her decease as under instant intestacy. In, what the fuck is that word? Intestacy? In hold on. Intestacy. Definition. Ugh. Intestacy, a situation in which someone dies without leaving instructions about who should be given their property. Oh, okay. So they're saying if... Okay. Huh. I think I understand what they're saying then. Okay, anyways. Beep. In which case, Lord Godalming, though so dear a friend, would have had no claim in the world, and the inheritors, being remote, would not be likely to abandon their just right for sentimental reasons regarding an entire stranger. I assure you, my dear sirs, I am rejoiced at the result, perfectly rejoiced. He was a good fellow, but his rejoicing at the one little part, in which he was officially interested, of so great a tragedy was an object lesson in the limitations of sympathetic understanding. He did not remain long, but said he would look in later the day, and see Lord Godalming. His coming, however, had been a certain comfort to us, since it assured us that we should not have to dread hostile criticism as to any of our acts. Arthur was expected at five o'clock, so, a little before that time, we visited the death chamber. It was so in very truth, for now both mother and daughter lay in it. The undertaker, true to his craft, had made the best display he could of the goods, and there was a mor mortuary air about the place that lowered our spirits at once. Van Helsing ordered the former arrangements to be adhered to, explaining that, as Lord Godalming was coming very soon, it would be less harrowing to his feelings to see all that was left of his fiancée quite alone. The undertaker seemed shocked at his own stupidity and exerted himself to restore things to the condition in which we left them the night before, so that when Arthur came, such shocks to his feelings as we could avoid were saved. Poor fellow. He looked desperately sad and broken. Even his stalwart manhood seemed to have shrunk somewhat under the strain of his much-tried emotions. He had, I knew, been very genuinely and devotedly attached to his father, and to lose him, and at such a time, was a bitter blow to him. With me he was warm as ever. To Van Helsing he was sweetly courteous, but I could not help seeing that there was some constraint with him. 
The professor noticed it too, and motioned me to bring him upstairs. I did so, and left him at the door of the room, as I felt he would like to be quite alone with her. But he took my arm and led me in, saying huskily, Wait, this is... Arthur? I'm pretty sure. Yes. <clears throat> you loved her too, old fellow. She told me all about it. And there was no friend had a closer place in her heart than you. I don't know how to thank you for all you have done for her. I can't think yet. And here he suddenly broke down and threw his arms around my shoulders and laid his head on my breast, crying, Oh, Jack, Jack, what shall I do? The whole of life seems gone from me at once, and there is nothing in the wide world for me to live for. I comforted him as well as I could. In such cases, men do not need much expression. A grip of the hand, the tightening of an arm over the shoulder, a sob in unison are expressions of sympathy dear to a man's heart. I stood still and silent till his sobs died away, and then I said softly to him, Come, look at her. Together we moved over to the bed, and I lifted the lawn from her face, and God, how beautiful she was. Every hour seemed to be enhancing her loveliness. It frightened and amazed me somewhat. And as for Arthur, he fell a-trembling, and finally was shaken with doubt, as with an egg, 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 egg. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> A-G-U-E, I never know how to pronounce that word. Egg, 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 egg. <laughs> egg. <clears throat> At last, after a long pause, he said to me in a faint whisper, Jack, is she really dead? I assured him sadly that it was so, and went on to suggest, for I felt that such a horrible doubt should not have life for a moment longer than I could help. That it often happened that after death, faces become softened, and even resolved into their youthful beauty. That this was especially so when death had been preceded by any acute or prolonged suffering, it seemed to quite do away with any doubt, and after kneeling beside the couch for a while and looking at her lovingly and long, he turned aside. I told him that that must be goodbye. The coffin had to be prepared. He went back and took her dead hand in his and kissed it, bent over and kissed her forehead. He came away fondly, looking back over his shoulder at her as he came. I left him in the drawing room and told Van Helsing that he had to say goodbye, so the latter went to the kitchen to tell the undertaker's men to proceed with the preparations and to screw up the coffin. When he came out of the room again, I told him of Arthur's question. He replied, I'm not surprised. Just now I doubted for a moment myself. We all dined together. I could see that poor Art was trying to make the best of things. Van Helsing had been silent at dinner time, but when we lit our cigars, he said, Lord! But Arthur interrupted him. No, 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 not that, for God's sake. Not yet, at any rate. Forgive me, sir, I did not mean to speak offensively. It is only because my loss is so recent. The professor answered sweetly. I only use that name because I was in doubt. I must not call you Mr. And I have grown to love you. Yes, my dear boy, to love you as Arthur. Arthur held out his hand and took the old man's warmly. Call me what you will, he said. I hope I may always have the title of friend. And let me say that I am at a loss for the words to thank you for your goodness to my poor dear. He paused a moment and went on. I know, I know that she understood your goodness even better than I do. And if I was rude or, or in any way wanting at that time, you acted so, you remember. The professor nodded. You must forgive me. He answered with a grave kindness. I know it was hard for you to quite trust me then. For to trust such violence needs to understand, and I take it that you do not understand, that you cannot trust me now, for you do not yet understand. And there may be more times when I shall want you to trust when you cannot, and may not, and must not yet understand. But the time will come when your trust shall be whole and complete in me, and when you shall understand as though the sunlight himself shone through. Then you shall bless me from first to last for your own sake, and for the sake of others, and for her dear sake, to whom I swore to protect. 
"'And indeed, indeed, sir,' said Arthur warmly, "'I shall in all ways trust you. "'I know and believe you have a very noble heart, "'and you are Jack's friend, and you were hers. "'You shall do what you like.' "'The professor cleared his throat a couple of times "'as though about to speak, and finally said, "'May I ask you something now?' "'Certainly. You know that Mrs. Westenra left you all of her property.' "'No, poor dear, I never thought of it. "'And as it is all yours, you have a right to deal with it as you will. "'I want you to give me permission to read all Miss Lucy's papers and letters. "'Believe me, it is no idle curiosity. "'I have a motive of which to be sure she would have approved. "'I have them all here.' I took them before we knew all that was yours, so that no strange hand might touch them, no strange eye look through so words of her soul. I shall keep them, if I may. Even you may not see them yet. But I shall keep them safe. No word shall be lost. And in good time I shall give them back to you. It's a hard thing I ask. But you will do it. Will you not? For Lucy's sake. Arthur spoke out heartily like his old self. Dr. Van Helsing, you may do what you will. I, I feel that in saying this I am doing what my dear one would have approved. I shall not trouble you with questions till the time comes. The old professor stood up as he said solemnly, And you are right. There will be pain for us all, but it will not be all pain. Nor will this pain be the last. We, and you too, you most of all, my dear boy, will have to pass through the bitter water before we we reached the sweet. But we must be brave of heart, and unselfish, and do our duty, and all will be well. I slept on a sofa in Arthur's room that night. Van Helsing did not go to bed at all. He went to and fro as if patrolling the house, and was never out of sight of the room where Lucy lay in her coffin, strewn with wild garlic flowers, which sent through the odor of lily and rose a heavy, overpowering smell into the night. One moment, I need a drink of water. Arthur as Arthur is growing on me. Yeah, I loved seeing in chat everybody like, no, I forgot. <laughs> ah. We're flashing over to Mina. Mina. The girl. All right. Mina Harker's journal. The 22nd of September. In the train to Exeter, Jonathan sleeping. It seems only yesterday that the last entry was made, and yet how much between then in Whitby and all the world before me. Jonathan away, no news of him, and now married to Jonathan. Jonathan a solicitor, a partner, rich, a master of his business. Mr. Hawkins dead and buried, and Jonathan with another attack that may harm him. Some day he may ask me about it. Down it all goes. I am rusty in my shorthand. See what unexpected prosperity does for us. It may as well be to freshen it up again with an, uh, with an exercise anyhow. The service was very simple and very solemn. There were only ourselves and the servants there, one or two old friends of his from Exeter, his London agent, and a gentleman representing Sir John Paxton, the president of the Incorporated Law Society. Jonathan and I stood hand in hand. We felt that our best and dearest friend was gone from us. We came back to town quietly, taking a bus to Hyde Park Corner. Jonathan thought it would interest me to go into the row for a while, so we sat down, but there were very few people there. It was sad-looking and desolate to see so many empty chairs. It made us think of the empty chair at home. We got up and walked down Piccadilly. Jonathan was holding me by the arm, the way he used to in the old days before I went to school. I felt it very improper. You can't go on for some years teaching etiquette and decorum to other girls without the pedantry of it biting into yourself a bit. But it was Jonathan, and he was my husband. And we didn't know anybody who saw us. We didn't care if they did. So on we walked. I was looking at a very beautiful girl, in a big cartwheel hat, sitting in a Victoria outside of Giuliano's, when I felt Jonathan clutch my arms so tight that he hurt me. He said under his breath, My God! I'm always anxious about Jonathan. I fear that some nervous fit may upset him again, so I turned to him quickly. I asked him what it was that disturbed him. He was very pale. His eyes seemed bulging out. 
As half in terror, half in amazement, he gazed at a tall, thin man with a beaky nose and a black mustache and a pointed beard. This person was also observing a pretty girl. He was looking at her so hard he did not see either of us, and so I had a good view of him. His face was not... well, it was not a good face. It was hard and cruel, sensual, with big white teeth. It looked all the whiter. His lips were so red, pointed like an animal's. And Jonathan just kept staring at him. I was afraid he would notice. I feared he might take it ill. He looked so fierce and nasty. I asked Jonathan why he was so disturbed, and he answered, evidently thinking that I knew as much about it as he did. Do you see who that is? Wait, 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 wait. Do you see who that is? No, dear, I said. I, I don't know him. Who is it? His answer seemed to shock and thrill me. For it was said as if he did not know that it was to me, Mina, to whom he was speaking. Uh. It is the man himself. The poor dear was evidently terrified at something, very greatly terrified. I do believe that if he had not had me to lean on and to support him, he would have sunk down. He kept staring. A man came out of the shop with a small parcel and gave it to the lady who then drove off. The dark man kept his eyes fixed on her. When the carriage moved up Piccadilly, he followed in the same direction and hailed a hansom. Jonathan kept looking after him and said as if to himself, I believe it is the Count, but he has grown young. My God, if this be so, oh my God, my God, if only I knew, if only I knew. He was distressing himself. Oh, he was distressing himself so much. I feared to keep his mind on the subject by asking him any questions, so I remained silent. I drew him away quietly. He, holding my arm, he came easily, and we walked a little further, then went in and sat for a while at the green park. It was a hot day for autumn. There was a comfortable seat in a shady place, and after a few minutes staring at nothing, Jonathan's eyes closed. He went quietly into his sleep with his head on my shoulder. I thought it was the best thing for him. I didn't disturb him, and in about twenty minutes he woke up, and he said to me quite cheerfully, Why, Mina, I've been asleep. Oh, do forgive me <gasps> for being so rude. Come, we'll have a cup of tea somewhere. He had evidently forgotten all about the dark stranger, as in his illness he had forgotten all that this episode had reminded him of. I don't like this lapsing of forgetfulness. It may make or continue some injury to the brain. I must not ask him. I fear it shall do more harm than good, but I must somehow learn the facts of his journey abroad. The time has come, I fear, when I must open that parcel and know what is written. Oh, Jonathan, you will, I know, forgive me if I do wrong, but it is for your own sake. A sad homecoming in every way later. The house empty of the dear soul who was so good to us, and Jonathan still pale and dizzy under a slight relapse of his malady, and now a telegram from Van Helsing, whoever he may be. Nope. <laughs> there are so many buttons now. You will be grieved to hear Mrs. Westenra died five days ago, and that Lucy died the day before yesterday. They were both buried today. Man, a very straight-to-the-point letter. Oh, what a wealth of sorrow in a few words! Lucy? Poor Mrs. Westenra, poor Lucy, gone! Gone never to return to us, and poor, poor Arthur to have lost such sweetness out of his life! God help us all to bear our troubles. Oh my god, Jonathan saw Dracula! Out on the prowl, dude! Hot damn, what's gonna happen? Oh my gosh. Well, we're going back to Dr. Seward. 22nd of September. It's all over. Arthur has gone back to Ring and has taken Quincy Morris with him. <sighs> what a fine fellow is Quincy. Man. Agreed. Retweet. <clears throat> Sorry. Uh, retweet. I believe in my heart of hearts that he suffered as much about Lucy's death as any of us, but he bore himself through it like a moral Viking. If America can go on breeding men like that, she will be a power in the world indeed. 
Van Helsing is lying down, having a rest preparatory to his journey. He goes to Amsterdam tonight, but says he returns tomorrow night, that he only wants to make some arrangements which he can only make personally. He is to stop with me, then, if he can. He says he has work to do in London, which may take him some time. Poor old fellow. I fear that the strain of the past week has broken down even his iron strength. All of the time of the burial he was, I could see, putting some terrible restraint on himself. When it was all over, we were standing beside Arthur, who, poor fellow, was speaking of his part in the operation where his blood had been transfused into his Lucy's veins. I could see Van Helsing's face grow white and purple by turns. Arthur was saying that he felt since then as if they two had really been married, and that she was his wife in the sight of God. None of us said a word of the other operations. <laughs> I was about to say, wait a minute. <laughs> He's like, we tra I gave my blood to her, and so truly we were married. And all the other dudes who also gave blood to her, like, pulling on their collars, like, Ooh, yeah, for sure, totally. Ahem. Arthur and Quincy went away together to the station. Van Helsing and I came on here. The moment we were alone in the carriage, he gave way to a regular fit of hysterics. He had denied to me since that it was hysterics, and insisted that it was only his sense of humor asserting itself under very terrible conditions. He laughed until he cried, and I had to draw down the blinds lest anyone should see us and misjudge. He cried till he laughed again, and laughed and cried together, just as a woman might. Alright, all right, Jack. <laughs> Chill out, man. I tried to be stern with him. As one is to a woman under the circumstances. Homie. <laughs> oh, goodness. Okay, anyways. <laughs> but it had no effect. Men and women so different in manifestations of nervous strength and weakness. When his face grew grave and stern again, I asked him, Why his mirth? Why at such a time? His reply was, in a way, characteristic of him, for it was logical and forceful and mysterious. He said, I almost hit Arthur again. <laughs> ah, you don't comprehend, Fen John. Do not think that I am not sad, though I laugh. I've cried, even though the laugh did choke me. No more think that I am all sorry when I cry, for the laugh he comes just the same. Keep it always with you, that laughter, who knock at your door and say, May I come in? It is not true laughter. No, he is a king. And he come when he and when, when, and he come when and how he like. He ask no person. He choose no time of suitability. He say, I am here. Behold, an example. I can't believe I chose this voice for a man that literally just like cannot cannot just like either he says way too little or way too much he he pulls out a fucking encyclopedia and he starts talking dude <laughs> god okay i'm taking another drink of water before i finish this all right we hit the room yeah it's not all about you van helsing okay anyways Ahem. Behold an example, I grieve my heart out for that so sweet young girl. I give my blood for her, though I am old and worn. I give my time, my skill, my sleep. I let my other sufferers want, so that she may have all, and yet I can laugh at her very grave. Laugh when the clay from the spade of the sexton drop upon her coffin and say, Thud! to my heart, till it send back the blood from my cheek. My heart bled for that poor boy, that dear boy. So of the age of mine own boy that I had been so blessed that he live, and with his hair and eyes the same. There, you know now why I love him so, and yet, when he says things that touch my husband heart to the quick and make my father heart yearn to him as no other man, not even you, friend John, for we are more level in experience than father and son, yet, even at such moment, King Laugh, he come to me and shout and bellow, Here I am, here I am, till the blood come dance back and bring some of the sunshine that he carry with him to my cheek. Oh, friend John, it is a strange world, a sad world. A world full of miseries and woes and troubles, and yet, when King Laugh come, he make them all dance to the tune he play. 
bleeding hearts and dry bones of the churchyard and tears that burn as they fall, all dance together to the music that he make with that smileless mouth. And believe me, friend John, he is good to come and kind. Ah, we men and women are like ropes drawn tight with strain that pull us different ways. And then tears, they come. And like the rain on the ropes, they brace us up until perhaps the strain become too great and we break. But King Laugh, he come like the sunshine, and he ease off the strain again, and we bear to go on with our labor, what it may be. I did not like to wound him by pretending not to see his idea, but as I did not yet understand the cause of his laughter, I asked him. As he answered me, his face grew stern. He said in quite a different tone, it was the grim irony of it all, this so lovely lady, garland with flowers, that looked so fair as life, till one by one we wondered if she were truly dead. She laid in that so fine marble house, in that lonely churchyard, where rest so many of her kin, laid there with the mother who loved her and whom she loved. And that sacred bell, toll, 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 so sad and slow, and those holy men with the white garments of the angel pretending to read books, and yet all the time their eyes never on the page. All of us with the bowed head, and for what? She is dead, so is it not? Well, for the life of me, Professor, I said. I can't see anything to laugh at in all of that. Why, your explanation makes it a harder puzzle than before. But even if the burial services were comic, what about poor Art and his trouble? Why, his heart was simply breaking. Just so. Said he not that the transfusion of his blood to her veins had made her truly his bride? Yes, and it was a sweet and comforting idea for him. Quite so, but there was a difficulty, friend John. If so, that... Then what of the others? Ho, ho! Then this so sweet maid, a polyandrist, and me with my poor wife dead to me, but alive by church's law, though no wits all gone, even I, who am faithful husband to this now no wife, am bigamist. I... I don't see where the joke comes in there, either, I said. And I did not feel particularly pleased with him for saying such things. He laid his head on my arm and said, Ah, friend John, forgive me if I pain. I showed not my feeling to others when it would wound, but only to you, my old friend whom I can trust. If you could have looked into my very heart when then I want to laugh, if you could have done so when the laugh arrived, if you could do so now when King Laugh has packed up his crown and all that is to him, he goes far, far away from me. For a long, long time. Maybe you would perhaps pity me the most of all. I was touched by the tenderness of his tone and asked why. Because I know! And now we are all scattered. And for many a long day loneliness will sit over our roofs and brooding wings. Lucy lies in the tomb of her kin, a lordly death house in a lonely churchyard away from teeming London, where the air is fresh and the sun rises over Hampstead Hill and where wild flowers grow of their own accord. So I can finish this diary, and God only knows if I shall ever begin another. If I do, or if I even open this again, it will be to deal with different people and different themes. For here, at the end, where the romance of my life is told, ere I go back to take up the thread of my life work, I say sadly, and without hope, Fini. The Westminster Gazette a Hampstead mystery. The neighborhood of Hampstead is just at present exercised with a series of events which seem to run on lines parallel to those of what was known to the writers of headlines as the Kensington Horror, or the Stabbing Woman, or the Woman in Black. During the past two or three days, several cases have occurred of young children straying from home or neglecting to return from their playing on the heath. In all these cases, the children were too young to give any properly intelligible account of themselves, but the consensus of their excuses is that they had been with a blue for lady. It has always been late in the evening when they have been missed, and on two occasions the children have not been found until early the following morning. It is generally supposed in the neighborhood that, as the first child missed gave his reason for being away that a blue for lady had asked him to come for a walk, the others had picked up the phrase and used it as occasion served. This is the more natural, as the favorite game of the little ones at present is luring each other away by wiles. A correspondent writes to us that some of the tiny tots pretended to be the blue for lady, 
and it's supremely funny. Some of our caricaturists might, he says, take a lesson in the irony of grotesque by comparing the reality in the picture. It is only in accordance with general principles of human nature, nature that the Bluefer Lady should be the popular role at these alfresco performances. Our correspondent naively says that even Ellen Terry could not be so winningly attractive as some of these grubby-faced children pretend, and even imagine themselves to be. There is, however, possibly a serious side to this question. For some of the children, indeed all, who have been missed at night, have been slightly torn or wounded in the throat. The wounds seem such as might be made by a rat or a small dog, and although of not much importance individually, would tend to show that whatever animal inflicts them has a, a system or method of its own. The police of the division have been instructed to keep a sharp lookout for straying children, especially when very young, in and around Hampstead Heath, and for any stray dog which may be around. Extra special, the Hampstead Horror, another child injured by the Bluefer Lady. We've just received intelligence that another child missed last night was only discovered late in the morning under a Ferd's bush at the Shooter's Hill side of the Hampstead Heath, which is perhaps less frequented than the other parts. It has the same tiny wound in the throat as has been noticed in other cases. It was terribly weak and looked quite emaciated. It too, when partially restored, had the common story to tell of being lured away by the blue for lady time to look up that's oh sorry that's the end of chapter 13 it's break time if you need to pee or anything go for it i'm gonna look up what the word blue for means hmm oxford english dictionary does not recognize this expression Urban Dictionary describes it as a female vampire, most probably from a child's mispronunciation of beautiful. Uh, Stoker may have employed this phrase after Dickens boofer for beautiful in his Our Mutual Friend. Adding the L to the word is a possible relation to bloody. Therefore, with this term, we can imagine a connection between the vampire and her victims, the children of Hampstead Heath interesting bloody like a bloody beautiful person bloofer <laughs> interesting so it started off as boofer but in dracula it became bloofer Yeah, I'm not going to read any more of this because it's spoilers and I don't want to spoil you, silly gooses. Ah. We go back to Mina next. <sighs> Thank goodness she's very easy to read. How are we doing so far, guys? Nice. Okay, I'm gonna fill my water back up. Because Lord knows I needed it that chapter. Jeez. Yeah, it's story 
time. <clears throat> I'm gonna do a quick sinus massage. I'm a bit stuffy, which makes it harder to read. Great job with the Van Helsing parts. Oh, thanks. He just talks so much, dude. I love that song. It's so good, isn't it? Oh my god, I've had it stuck in my head for days. Same situation, I've got a regular flu. I've been blowing my nose for days, yeah. I don't have any full-on sickness yet, but uh, I've just been stuffy, you know, tis the season, so. I've been doing a lot of, like, sinus pressure sort of stuff that <clears throat> definitely clears me up. It's called Girlfriend by Hemlock. Oh my god. Uh, Hemlock Springs. It's, it's a very good song. Okay, we're back in it. Ready? Chapter 14. Starting with Mina Harker's journal. September 23rd. Jonathan is better after a bad night. I'm so glad that he has plenty of work to do, for that keeps his mind off the terrible things. And oh, I am rejoiced that he is now not so weighed down with the responsibility of his new position. I knew he would be true to himself, and now how proud I am to see my Jonathan rising to the height of his advancement, and keeping pace in all ways with the duties that come upon him. He will be away all day till late, for he said he could not lunch at home. My household work is done. I'll take his foreign journal and lock myself up in my room and read it. September 24th. I hadn't the heart to write last night. The terrible record of Jonathan's upset me so. My poor dear, how he must have suffered. Whether it be true or only imaginary, I wonder if there is any truth in it at all. Did he get his brain fever and write all these terrible things? Or had he some cause for it all? I suppose I shall never know. I dare not open the subject to him, and yet, that man we saw yesterday, he seemed quite certain of him. Oh, poor fellow. I suppose it was the funeral upset him. It set his mind back on some train of thought. He believes it all himself. I remember how on our wedding day he said, Unless some solemn duty come upon me to go back to the bitter hours, asleep, awake, mad, or sane. There seems to be, through it all, some thread of continuity. That fearful count was coming to London. If it should be, and he came to London with his teeming millions, there may be a solemn duty. And if it comes, we must not shrink from it. I'll be prepared. I'll get my typewriter this very hour and begin transcribing, and then we shall be ready for other eyes if required. And if it be wanted, then perhaps if I'm ready, poor Jonathan may not be upset. I can speak for him, and never let him be troubled or worried with it at all. If ever Jonathan quite gets over the nervousness, he may want to tell me of it all, and I can ask him questions and find out things, and see how I might comfort him. Dear Madam, <laughs> I pray you to pardon my writing in that I am so far friend as that I sent you sad news of Miss Lucy Westenra's death. By the kindness of Lord Godalming, I am empowered to read her letters and papers, for I am deeply concerned about certain matters vitally important. In them I find some letters from you which show how great of friends you were and how you loved her. Oh, Madam Mina, by that love I implore you to help me. It is for others' good that I ask to redress great wrong and to lift much and terrible troubles that may be more great than you can know. May it be that I see you. You can trust me. 
Trust me, bro. I am friend of Dr. John Seward and of Lord Godalming, Arthur of Miss Lucy. I must keep it private for the present from all. I should come to Exeter to see you at once if you would tell me I am privileged to come and where and when. I implore your pardon, madam. I've read your letters to poor Lucy and know how good you are and how your husband suffers. So I pray you, if it may be, enlighten him not, lest it may harm. Your pardon and forgive me. Van Helsing. September 25th. Come today by quarter past ten train if you can catch it. Can see you any time that you call. Wilhelmina Harker. Wilhelmina Harker. September 25th. I cannot help feeling terribly excited as the time draws near for the visit of Dr. Van Helsing, for somehow I expect it will throw some light upon Jonathan's sad experience. As he attended poor dear Lucy in her last illness, he can tell me all about her. It is the reason of his coming. It's concerning Lucy and her sleepwalking. It's not about Jonathan. I shall never know the real truth now. <laughs> How silly I am. That awful journal gets a hold of my imagination, and, and it tinges everything with something of its own color. Of course, it's about Lucy. The habit came back to the poor dear. That awful night on the cliff, it must have made her ill. I had almost forgotten in all my own affairs how ill she was afterward. She must have told him of her sleepwalking adventure on the cliff and that I knew all about it. And now he wants me to tell him what she knows so that he may understand. Oh, I hope I did right in not saying anything of it to Mrs. Westenra. I should never forgive myself if any act of mine, were it even a negative one, brought harm on poor dear Lucy. I hope, too, that Dr. Van Helsing will not blame me. I've had so much trouble and anxiety of late, I feel I cannot bear more just at present. But I suppose a cry does us all good at times. It clears the air as other rain does. Perhaps it was reading the journal yesterday that upset me, and then Jonathan went away this morning to stay away from me a whole day and night, the first time we've been parted since our marriage. I do hope the dear fellow will take care of himself, and that nothing will occur to upset him. It, it's two o'clock. The doctor will be here soon now. I'll say nothing of Jonathan's journal, unless he asks me. I am so glad I've typewritten out my own journal, so that in case he asks about Lucy, I can hand it to him. It will save so much questioning. Later. He has come and gone. What a strange meeting, and how it all makes my head whirl round. I feel like one in a dream. Can it be possible? Or even part of it? If I had not read Jonathan's journal first, I should never have accepted even a possibility. Oh, my poor dear Jonathan, how he must have suffered. Please, the good God, all this may upset him again. I shall try to save him from it, but it may be even a consolation and a help to him, terrible though it may be and awful in its consequence, to know for certain that his eyes and ears and brain did not deceive him, that it is all true. It may be that it is the doubt which haunts him. That maybe when the doubt is removed, no matter which, waking or dreaming, may prove the truth, he will be more satisfied and better able to bear the shock. Dr. Van Helsing must be a good man as well as a clever one if he is Arthur's friend and Dr. Seward's. And if they brought him all the way from Holland to look after Lucy, well, I feel from having seen him that he is good and kind and of a noble nature. When he comes tomorrow, I shall ask him about Jonathan, and then... Please, God, all this sorrow and anxiety may lead to a good end. I used to think I would like to practice interviewing. Jonathan's friend on the Exeter News told him that memory was everything in such work, that you must be able to put down exactly almost every word spoken, even if you had to refine some of it afterward. Here was a rare interview. I shall try to record it verbatim. You can't see me, but I leaned back in my chair and whoa. You don't have to recall everything, Dr. Van Helsing said. You don't have to, Mina. You don't gotta. <laughs> oh. Every, every word. Every word if she is to be an interviewer. Every word. She must. All right. It was half past two o'clock when the knock came. It took my courage a deux mains and waited. 
In a few minutes, Mary opened the door and announced a Dr. Van Helsing. I rose and bowed. He came toward me, a man of medium weight, strongly built with his shoulders set back over a broad, deep chest, and a neck well balanced on the trunk as his head is on the neck. The poise of the head strikes one at once as indicative of thought and power. Noble, well-sized, broad, and large behind the ears, the face was clean-shaven. It showed a hard, square chin, a large, resolute, mobile mouth, a good-sized nose, rather straight but with quick, sensitive nostrils that seem to broaden as the big, bushy brows come down and the mouth tightens. The forehead is broad and fine, rising at first almost straight, and then sloping back above two bumps on ridges wide apart. Such a forehead. The reddish hair cannot possibly tumble over it, but falls naturally back into the sides, big, dark blue eyes set widely apart, and are quick and tender, or stern with the man's moods. So he said to me, Mrs. Harker, is it not? I bowed assent. Uh, that was Miss Mina Murray? Again I assented. It is Mina Murray that I came to see that was a friend of the poor dear child Lucy Westenra. Madam Mina, it is on account of the dead that I come. Sir, I said, you could have no better claim on me than that you were a friend and a helper of Lucy Westenra. I held out my hand, and he took it and said tenderly, Oh, Madam Mina, I know that the friend of that poor lily girl must be good, but I had yet to learn. He finishes his speech with a courtly bow. I asked him what it was he wanted to see me about, and so he at once began. I've read your letters to Miss Lucy. Well, forgive me. I had to begin to inquire somewhere, and there was none to ask. I know that you were with her at Whitby. She sometimes kept a diary. You need not look surprised, Madam Mina. It was begun after you had left, and was an imitation of you. In that diary she traces by inference certain things to a sleepwalking in which she puts down that you saved her. In great perplexity, then, I come to you and ask you, out of so much kindness, to tell me all of it that you can remember. I can tell you. I think, Dr. Van Helsing, all about it. Oh, then you have a good memory, for facts, for details. It is not always so with young ladies. I leaned back in the chair again. This is really ineffective when you can't see me. <laughs> I'm shocked you have a good memory. Normally women can't remember anything. <laughs> no, doctor, but I wrote it down all, uh, I wrote it all down at the time. I can show it to you if you like. Oh, Madam Mina, I would be grateful. You would do me so much favor. I could not resist the temptation of mystifying him a bit. I suppose it is some of the taste of the original apple that remains still in our mouths. I handed him the short, wait, is that a, is that a, is, is that <laughs> Was that an Adam and Eve reference? I handed him the shorthand diary, and he took it with a grateful bow and said, May I read it? If you wish, I answered, as demurely as I could. He opened it, and for an instant his face fell. Then he stood up and bowed. Oh, you clever woman, he said. I knew long that Mr. Jonathan was a man of much thankfulness, but see, his wife has all the good things. And will you not so much honor me, and so help me as to read it? Alas, I know not the shorthand. By this time my joke was over, and I was almost ashamed. I took the typewritten copy from my work basket and handed it to him. Forgive me, I said, I couldn't help it, but I had been thinking that it was of dear Lucy that you wished to ask, and so that you might not have time to wait. Not on my account, but because I know your time must be precious. I've written it out on the typewriter for you. He took it, and his eyes glistened. You are so good, he said, and may I read it now? I may want to ask you such things when I have read. Oh, by all means, I said. Read it over whilst I order lunch, and then you can ask me questions while I eat. He bowed and settled. It was while we eat. I'm sorry. I really I really set her up as being like that sort of person. He's like, I'll eat. I hope you brought something to eat. Anyways. Settled himself into a chair with his back to the light and became absorbed in the papers, whilst I went to see after lunch chiefly in order that he might not be disturbed. When I came back, I found him walking hurriedly up and down the room, his face ablaze with excitement. He rushed up to me and took me by both hands. Oh, Madam Mina, he said. <coughs> How can I say what I owe you? This paper is as sunshine. It opens the gate to me. I am dazed, I am dazzled, with so much light, and yet clouds roll in behind the light every time. But that you do not, cannot comprehend. Oh, but I am grateful to you, you clever woman. 
Madam, he said this solemnly, if ever Abraham Van Helsing can do anything for you or yours, I trust you will let me know. It will be a pleasure and a delight if I might serve you as a friend, as a friend. But all I have ever learned, all I can ever do, shall be for you and those you love. There are darknesses in life, and there are lights, and you are one of the lights, and you will have a happy life and a good life, and your husband will be blessed in you. Oh, but doctor, you praise me too much, and, and you do not know me, not know you, I, who am old and who have studied all my life, men and women, I, who have made my specialty the brain, and all that belongs to him, and all that follow from him, and I have read your diary that you have so goodly written for me, and which breathes out truth of every line, I, who have read your so sweet letter to poor Lucy of your marriage, and your trust not know you, oh! Madam Mina, good women, tell all their lives, and by day, and by hour, and by minute, such things that angels can read. And we men, who wish to know, have in us something of angels' eyes. Your husband is noble nature, and you are noble too, for your trust, and trust cannot be where there is mean nature. And your husband, tell me of him, is he quite well? Is all that fever gone, and he is strong and hearty? I saw here an opening to ask him about Jonathan, so I said, well, he was almost recovered, but he has been greatly upset by Mr. Hawkins' death. He interrupted, Oh, yes, I know, I know. I have read your last two letters. I went on. I suppose this upset him. When we were in town on Thursday last, he had a sort of a shock. A shock? And after brain fever so soon, not good, what kind of shock? Well, he thought he saw someone who recalled something terrible. Something which led to his brain fever. And here, the whole thing seemed to overwhelm me in a rush. The pity for Jonathan, the horror which he experienced, the whole fearful mystery of the diary, the fear that had been brooding over me ever since, it all came in a tumult. And I suppose I was hysterical. I threw myself on my knees and held up my hands to him and implored him to make my husband well again. He took my hands and raised me up, made me sit on the sofa, sat by me. He held my hands in his and said to me with, oh, such infinite sweetness, my life is a barren and lonely one, so full of work that I have not had time much for friendships. And since I have been summoned here by my friend John Seward, I have known so many good people and seen such nobility that I feel more than ever. It has grown with my advancing years, the loneliness of my life. Believe me, then, that I come here full of respect for you, and you have given me hope, hope not in what I am seeking of, but that there are good women left to make life happy, good women whose lives and whose truths may make good lesson for the children that are to be. Glad, glad that I may here be of some use to you. For if your husband suffer, he suffer within the range of my study and experience. I promise you I will gladly do all for him that I can, all to make his life strong and manly and your life a happy one. Now you must eat. You are overwrought and perhaps over-anxious. Husband Jonathan would not like to see you so pale, and what he like not where he love is not to see his good. Therefore, for his sake you must eat and smile. You have told me all about Lucy, and so now we shall not speak of it, lest it distress. I shall stay in Exeter tonight, for I wish to think much over what you have told me, and when I have thought I will ask you questions, if I may. And then, too— you will tell me of husband Jonathan's trouble, so far as you can tell, but not yet. You must eat now. Afterward, you shall tell me all. After lunch, when we went back to the drawing room, he said to me, Now, tell me all about him. <laughs> when it came to speaking to this great learned man, I began to fear that he would think me a weak fool and Jonathan a madman. That journal it was so strange and I hesitated to go on. But he was so sweet and kind. He had promised to help, and I trusted him. So I said, Dr. Van Helsing, what I have to tell you is so queer that you must not laugh at me or my husband. I, I have been since yesterday in a sort of fever of doubt. You must be kind to me. Do not think me foolish. I have even half believed some very strange things. He reassured me by his manner as well as his words when he said, Oh, my dear. If only you knew how strange is the matter regarding which I am here, it is you who would laugh. I have learned not to think little of anyone's belief, no matter how strange it may be. I've tried to keep an open mind, and it is not the ordinary things of life that could close it, but the strange things, the extraordinary things, the things that make one doubt if they may be mad or sane. 
Is this Mina? Yeah. Thank you, thank you a thousand times. You've taken a weight off of my mind. Well, if you will let me, I shall give you a paper to read. It is long, but I have typewritten it out. It will tell you my trouble, and Jonathan's, a copy of his journal when abroad, and all that happened. I dare not say anything of it. You'll read for yourself and judge, and then, when I see you, perhaps you will be very kind and tell me what you think. I promise, he said as I gave him the papers. I shall in the morning, so soon as I can, come to see you and your husband, if I may. Well, Jonathan will be here at half-past eleven. You must come lunch with us and see him then. You could catch the quick 3.34 train. That'll leave you at Paddington before eight. He was surprised at my knowledge of the trains offhand. But he does not know that I have made up all the trains to and from Exeter so that I may help Jonathan in case he is in a hurry. So he took the papers with him and went away. And I sit here thinking, thinking, I don't know what. Small break. A small break. Shrimp check. <sighs> yeah, I'm I'm getting sleepy, but I don't want to drink coffee because then it'll keep me up. Hmm, what to do? Oh, <gasps> maybe an ice cream? Is that crazy? <laughs> Winter is coming, but what if I had ice cream? Maybe I should just get up and do a bunch of like jumping jacks or something. I'll be right back. Hello. Okay. I got two weird things. I got... <laughs> I grabbed a knobbly bobbly and a homemade Uncrustable. <laughs> so we're gonna sit and eat that really quick.
made Uncrustable. Yeah, dude. I have all the... I basically had like a whole loaf of bread. It was on its last leg. Leg? It was on its last leg. And we have um, the little press. You can get them for super cheap, but we have little presses to make like Uncrustables, right? The problem with Uncrustables is that you wind up with all of the crusts. What do you do with the crusts? And I saw a video where somebody rolled up the crusts and then like dipped them into an egg mixture with um, sugar and cinnamon. And I was like, hell yeah, <laughs> that's great. They're like little, they're like little toast cinnamon rolls basically. So I saved all of the crusts. So I might do that tomorrow with them. Hello, yeah. I'm trying to wake myself up and my throat is hurting already. So I'm eating a knobbly bobbly. Let me take a quick break. <laughs> I already, I already have loads of breadcrumbs. I do not need more breadcrumbs. Hi, hey, Sherlock. Hmm. Yeah, it's just an ice cream with like sprinkles all over it. Hundreds of thousands, is that what you guys call them? I'll move you further away from me. <laughs> oh, Tay, welcome. I ain't doing anything on Thanksgiving either. So welcome. Hang out with us. We're reading Dracula and eating knobbly bobblies. <laughs> God, Sherlock's on a rampage. Sherlock, what are you doing? Hi, I know. Yeah. So I'll just walk around the house yowling until somebody's like, hey, buddy. legitimately wakes up Clark sometimes so it drives me crazy when he's doing it like right outside of her room I'm like stop <laughs> stop Yeah, on one hand it's sweet because most of the time when he does it, it's when Clark is upset. It's like a weird response of like, oh no, she's sad. Now I must pace around in front of her room and yowl <laughs> to let it alert everybody to the sadness, you know. I'm like, that's cute, but... Every single time Clark's like, can you shut the door? Sherlock's so loud. <laughs> Hi, Ned. I gave him lots of pets just now, don't worry.
I finished my book, not Dracula, but Library at Mount Char. And um, every time I talk about this book, I keep being like, it's good, but it's so fucking weird. What a weird book that I can't stop reading. What a, what a weird fucking fever dream. And then the second I finished it, I was like, I have to go see what reviews of this book are like. <laughs> And almost every review of the book is like, it was good, but it was fucking weird. <laughs> like, I think it was good, but man, what a weird book. <laughs> like, I'm glad it wasn't just me. It's called The Library at Mount Char. Um, the It was recommended when someone asked, like, Someone was basically like, hey, people keep recommending books where, like, someone is kidnapped by a fae creature and, you know, has, like, a great time. <laughs> and I, I want a story about somebody getting kidnapped by a fae creature and has a bad time in all capitals, you know, like, <laughs> like a really bad time. Like, can I get that story? Um, and this one was recommended and a bunch of people in the comment section were like, oh, I love that book. It's so weird. So I went to read it and fuck, it's super weird. But I, I mean, I slam, I'm not, I'm not a, a voracious reader, so to speak, but I slammed that book in two days. How far in the book are you? In Dracula? Um, we're about halfway. Halfway through the whole thing. Annihilation by Jeff Vandermeer. One sec. Yeah, I think that's the thing, right? Is people are like... <clears throat> I think there are plenty of people that are really interested and engaged by... Um, you know, like... Fey creatures being dickheads. Like, not being nice at all. Um... <clears throat> Because they don't see a reason to be, you know. Um, and so, it, yeah, I think, like, there is definitely an interest in finding books that, that use that in an interesting way, you know. I also, I need to, I need to finish Murderbot. I only read the first couple. And Donut, happy three years! Thank you so much! Okay. <sighs> I ate an ice cream. Had a sip of water. Got up, walked around. Stretched. Let's go. Where were we? Oh, good. A handwritten letter from Van Helsing. All right. <laughs> Let's buckle up. Dear Madam Mina... I've read your husband's so wonderful diary, and you may sleep without doubt. Strange and terrible as it is, it is true. I will pledge my life on it. It may be worse for others, but for him and you there is no dread. He is a noble fellow, and let me tell you from experience of men, that one who would do as he did in going down that wall, that wall into that room, I, and going a second time, is not one to be injured in permanence by shock. 
His brain and his heart are all right, this I swear, before I have even seen him, so be at rest. I shall have much to ask him of other things. I am blessed that today I have come to see you, for I have learned all at once so much that again I am dazzled, dazzled more than ever, and I must think. Yours most faithful. My dear Dr. Van Helsing, a thousand thanks for your kind letter, which has taken a great weight off of my mind. And yet, if it be true, what terrible things there are in the world. What an awful thing, if that man, that monster, be really in London. I fear to think. I have this moment whilst writing had a wire from Jonathan saying he leaves by the 625 tonight from Launceston and will be here at 1018 so that I shall have no fear tonight. Will you therefore, instead of lunching with us, please come to breakfast at eight o'clock? If this be not too early for you, you can get away if you are in a hurry by the 1030 train, which will bring you to Paddington by 235. Do not answer this, as I shall take it that if I do not hear, you will come to breakfast. Believe me, your faithful and grateful friend, Mina Harker. Are you guys ready? I don't know if you guys are ready. Are you ready? We're back to beep, 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 Jonathan Dabs. September 26th. I thought never to write in this diary again, but the time has come. When I got home last night, Mina had supper ready, and when we had supped, she told me of Van Helsing's visit, and of her having given him the two diaries copied out, and of how anxious she had been about me. She showed me in the doctor's letter that all I wrote down was true. It seems to have made a new man of me. It was the doubt as to the reality of the whole thing that knocked me over. I felt impotent, in the dark, distrustful, but now that I know, I'm not afraid, not even of the Count. He has succeeded after all then in his design of getting to London, and it was he that I saw. He's gotten younger, and, and how? Well, Van Helsing is the man to unmask him and hunt him out, if he is anything like what Mina says. We sat late and talked it all over. Mina is dressing, and I shall call at the hotel in a few minutes and bring him over. He was, I think, surprised to see me. When I came into the room where he was and introduced myself, he took me by the shoulder and turned my face round to the light and said, after a sharp scrutiny, Madam Mina told me you were ill, that you had a shock. It was so funny to hear my wife called Madam Mina by this kindly, strong-faced old man. I smiled and said, well, I was ill. I have had a shock, but you have cured me. And how? By your letter to Mina last night. I was in doubt, and then everything took a hue of unreality. I did not know what to trust, even the evidence of my own senses. Not knowing what to trust, I did not know what to do. And so had only to keep on working in what had hitherto been the groove of my life. The groove ceased to avail me, and I mistrusted myself. Doctor... You don't know what it is to doubt everything, even yourself. No, you don't. You couldn't with eyebrows like yours. <laughs> oh, Jonathan. You really are getting your groove back, dude. <laughs> he seemed pleased and laughed as he said, So, you are a physiognomist. I learn more here with each hour. I am with so much pleasure coming to you to breakfast, and oh, sir, you will pardon praise from an old man, but you are blessed in your wife. I would listen to him go on praising Mina for a day. I nodded and stood silent. Uh, oh, yeah, this is definitely this dude. She is one of God's women, fashioned by his own hand, and shown us men and other women that there is a heaven where we can enter, that its light can be here on earth, so true, sweet, noble, so little an egoist. And that, let me tell you, is much in this age, so skeptical and selfish, and you, sir. I have read all the letters to poor Miss Lucy, and some of them speak of you, so I know you since some days from night. You will give me your hand, will you not? And let us be friends for all of our lives. We shook hands. It was a lot, but we did it. He was so earnest and so kind, it made me quite choky. And now, he said, may I ask you for some more help? I have a great task to do, and at the beginning it is to know. You can help me here. Can you tell me what went before your going to Transylvania? Later on I may ask more help, and of a different kind, but first this will do. Well, look here, sir, I said. Does what you have to do concern the Count? It does, he said solemnly. 
then I am with you, heart and soul. As you go by the 10.30 train, you will not have time to read them, but I shall get the bundle of papers. You can take them with you and read them after... Oh, and read them in the train. After breakfast, I saw him to the station. When we were parting, he said, Perhaps you will come to town if I send to you, and take Madame Mina, too. We shall both come when you will, I said. I got him the previous morning papers and the London papers. Oh, I got him the morning papers and the London papers of the previous night. And while we were talking at the carriage window, waiting for the train to start, he was turning them over, his eyes suddenly seeming to catch something in one of them. The Westminster Gazette. I knew it by the color. He grew quite white. He read something intently, groaning to himself. Mein Gott, mein Gott, so soon, so soon. I don't think he remembered me in that moment. But just then the whistle blew and the train moved off. This recalled him to himself and he leaned out of the window and waved his hand, calling out, Love to Miss Mina, I shall write so soon as ever I can. Dr. Seward's Diary, September 26th. Truly, there is no such thing as finality. Not a week since I said fini. And yet here I am, starting fresh again, or rather going on with the same record. Until this afternoon, I had no cause to think of what is done. Renfield had become, to all intents, as sane as he ever was. He was already well ahead with his fly business, and he had just started in the spider line as well. He had not been of any trouble to me. I had a letter from Arthur, written on Sunday. From it I gathered that he is bearing up wonderfully well. Quincy Morris is with him, and that is of much help. For he himself is a bubbling well of good spirit. Quincy wrote me a line, too. From him I hear that Arthur is beginning to recover something of his old buoyancy. So as to them all, my mind is at rest. And as for myself, I was settling down to my work with the enthusiasm which I used to have for it, so that I might fairly have said that the wound which poor Lucy left on me was becoming... Cicatrized? Time to look up another word. Uh, cicatrized? <sighs> Heal by scar formation. His wound had cicatrized. Okay. Interesting. Where were we? I don't remember. There it is. Everything is, however, now reopened, and what is to be the end, God only knows. I have an idea that Van Helsing thinks he knows too, but he will only let out enough at a time to whet curiosity. He went to Exeter yesterday and stayed there all night. Today he came back and almost bounded into the room at about half past five o'clock and thrust last night's Westminster Gazette into my hand. And what do you think of that? He asked as he stood back and folded his arms. I looked over the paper, for I really did not know what he meant, but he took it from me and pointed out a paragraph about children being decoyed away at Hampstead. It did not convey much to me. Was that my child? Was that my baby? <laughs> One moment. <laughs>
Hello. Sorry about that. Oh my god. Um, I do not know how long this will last. <laughs> but for now, she's back in bed. So we'll see. It might be that... Oh. Might have to split Dracula into two. We'll see. But in the meantime... Pretty good uncrustable. Okay. Oh my god, what were we even doing? What was even happening? Right. Oh, oh right. We are the doctor. Yes. Okay. Okay. Ready? Break. Um It is like poor Lucy's. Hi. There she is. She's back. Hi, Bubby. Okay. I'm just finishing up work. My glove? Your glove? Oh. I'm not sure, baby. Were you having a dream about a glove, do you think? Yeah. Yeah. Ooh. I'll be right back. Hello. Hi. <laughs> okay. Look, we've had a couple really successful, smooth sailing Dracula streams. It, it only makes sense that we eventually <laughs> have a Dracula stream where it's a slog to get through even two chapters. I'm really sorry about this, guys. Um, yeah, we're gonna finish off this chapter, and then I think I'm gonna go and we'll uh, we'll do the uh, the other two chapters Saturday night, probably. I think is what we're gonna try to do. So, because I don't think I have. Mm. 
I might have to double check that. Either either Saturday or next Tuesday. <laughs> okay. Let's get through this. I believe. I believe in us. <laughs> what were we doing? I was a doctor. Um... Simply that there is some cause in common. Whatever it was that injured her has injured them. I did not quite understand his answer. That is true indirectly, but not directly. How do you mean, Professor? I asked. I was a little inclined to take his seriousness lightly, for, after all, four days of rest and freedom from burning, harrowing anxiety does help to restore one's spirits. But when I saw his face, it sobered me. Never even in the midst of our despair about poor Lucy had he looked more stern. Well, tell me, I said. I can hazard no opinion. I do not know what to think. I have no data on which to find a conjecture. Do you mean to tell me, friend John, that you have no suspicion as to what poor Lucy died of? Not after all the hints given, not only by events, but by me. Of nervous prostration, following on great loss or waste of blood, and how the blood lost or waste? I shook my head. He stepped over and sat down beside me and went on. You are a clever man, friend John. You reason well, your wit is bold, but you are too prejudiced. You do not let your eyes see, nor your ears hear. And that which is outside your daily life is not of account to you. Do you not think that there are things which you cannot understand, and yet which are? That some people see things that others cannot, but there are things old and new which must not be contemplated by men's eyes, because they know, or think that they know, some things which other men have told them. Ah, it is the fault of our science that it wants to explain all, and if it explains not, then it says there is nothing to explain, but yet... We see around us every day the growth of new beliefs which think themselves new, and which are yet but old, which pretend to be young like the fine ladies of the opera. I suppose now you do not believe in corporeal transference, no? Materialization? Nor in astral bodies? No, nor in the reading of thought? Nor in hypnotism? Yes, I said. Charcot has proven that pretty well. He smiled as he went on. Then you are satisfied as to it, Yes. And, of course, then you understand how it acts, and can follow the mind of the great Charcot. Alas, that he is no more. Into the very soul of the patient that he influences, no? Then, friend John, am I to take it that you simply accept fact, and are satisfied to let from premise to conclusion be a blank? No? Then tell me, for I am a student of the brain. How you accept the hypnotism and reject the thought-reading? Let me tell you, my friend. There are things done today in electrical science which would have been deemed unholy by the very men who discovered electricity, who would themselves not so long before have been burned as wizards. There are always mysteries in life. Why was it that Methuselah lived 900 years and old Parr 169, and yet poor Lucy, with four men's blood in her poor veins, could not live even a day? For she had... For had she live... Li for had... For had she lived one more day, we could have saved her. Do you know all the mysteries of life and death? Do you know all together of the comparative anatomy and can say wherefore the qualities of brutes are in some men and not in others? Can you tell me why, when other spiders die small and soon, one great spider lived for centuries in the tower of the old Spanish church and grew and grew till on descending he could drink the oil of the church lamps? Can you tell me why, in the pampas, I and elsewhere, there are bats that come at night and open the veins of cattle and horses and suck dry their veins? How in some islands of the western seas there are bats which hang on the tree all day, and those who have seen describe as like giant nuts or pods, and that when the sailors sleep on the deck because it is hot, flit down on them, and then, and then in this morning are found dead men, white, as Miss Lucy was. Good God, Professor, I said, starting up, do you mean to tell me that Lucy was bitten by such a bat, and that such a thing is here in London in the 19th century? He waved his hand for a silence and went on. Can you tell me? Why the tortoise lives more long than generations of men. Why the elephant goes on and on till he has seen dynasties. Why the parrot never dies only of a bite of cat or dog or other complaint. Can you tell me why men believe in all ages and places that there are some few who live on always if they be permit? 
that there are men and women who cannot die. We all know, because science has vouched for the fact. There have been toads shut up in rocks for thousands of years, shut in one so small hole that only hold him since the youth of the world. Can you tell me how the Indian fakir can make himself to die and have been buried and his grave sealed and corn sowed on it and the corn reaped and be cut and sown and reaped and cut again? And then men come and take the unbroken seal and that there lies the Indian fakir not dead, but risen up and walking amongst them as before. And here I interrupted him. I was getting bewildered. He was so crowded on my mind. His list of nature's eccentricities and possible possibilities. My imagination was getting fired. I had a dim idea that he was teaching me some lesson. Hey, hey. That's mine. I had a dim idea that he was teaching me some lesson, as long ago he used to do in the study at Amsterdam. But he used then to tell me the thing, so that I could have the object of thought in mind the whole time. Now I was without this help. Yet I wanted to follow him, so I said, Professor, let me be your pet student again. Tell me the thesis, so that I might apply your knowledge as you go on. As present, I am going in my mind from point to point as a madman, not a sane one follows an idea. I feel like a novice lumbering through a bog in a mist, jumping from one tussock to the other in the mere blind effort to move on without knowing where I am going. Well, that is a good image he said. Well, I shall tell you. My thesis is this, and I want you to believe. To believe what? To believe in things that you cannot. Let me illustrate. I heard once of an American who so defined faith that faculty which enables us to believe things which we know to be untrue. For one, I follow that man. He meant that we shall have an open mind, and not let a little bit of truth check the rush of a big truth. Like a small rock does a railway truck, we get the small truth first. Good! We keep him, and we value him, but all the same we must not let him think himself all the truth of the universe. Then you want me not to let some previous conviction injure the receptivity of my mind with regard to some strange matter. Do I read your lesson right? Ah, you are my favorite pupil still. It is worth to teach you. Now, you are willing to understand. You have taken the first step to understand. You think, then... That those small holes in the children's throats were made by the same thing that made the holes in Miss Lucy. I suppose so. He stood up and said solemnly, Then you are wrong! Would it were so, but alas, no, it is worse, far worse. Well, in God's name, Professor Van Helsing, what do you mean? I cried. He threw himself with a despairing gesture into a chair and placed his elbows on the table, covering his face with hands as he spoke. They were made by Miss Lucy. Dun dun dun! That's the end of the chapter. <laughs> Gasp! And hey, we're 200 pages in, everybody. Claps all around. Claps all around, everybody. <laughs> all right i'm sorry that we have to cut this short we'll definitely make sure to do the last couple of chapters i did not mean for it to be this way but duty calls dabs and we got through a couple chapters. <laughs> it was great. Oh, shucks. Hopefully next time that we read, I can be a bit more awake for it as well. Oh, I'm glad. I'm glad, guys. Thanks for the stream, Van Helsing. Wow. <laughs> yeah shout out to everybody who's just like looking for something to watch on thanksgiving um i'm i'm happy to have been that for you for a couple hours i think sam is streaming i could just shoot you guys over to him let me check yeah yeah i'll send, I'll send you guys to sam 
But really quickly. Marluz, thank you for the 37 months. Self-care, best care for the 40. Joseph for the 73. Subbo for the gifted subs. Thanks, bud. Killer Wombat for the 4. Seza for the gifted subs as well. Thank you so, so much. Seza also subscribed. Welcome to the cat gang. Thank you. Kirarita, thank you for the 41. Shadow of the Potato for the 35. Citizen Quinn for the 32. Mad Raxon for subscribing. Welcome to the cat gang. Thank you so much. Zeriastix for the 53. Mighty Deacon for the 59. Major for the 63. Merlin Herc for the 76. Dona for the three years. Happy anniversary. And Mighty Metal for the 63. <laughs> yeah, thanks so much, guys. Here, let's go ahead and raid my sweet love. Go say hi. Um, I normally say go say hi, spread love, spread joy. I don't know what the vibe is going to be there, to be honest. Um, you might need to spread more love and joy than usual. <laughs> we shall see. Um, but I'm going to go attend to my kid. Just having a rough night. Um, but I appreciate you all being here. And we'll make sure that we do these last couple of chapters in the next few days. Okay? Thanks so much, everybody. Take care. Bye-bye.